Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts, of George Mason University and Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, find other episodes, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is June 13th, 2011, and my guest is Mike Munger of Duke University. Mike, welcome back to Econ Talk. It's always great to be on Econ Talk, and I'm in Erlangen, Germany. What are you doing there? Well, I came here to give some talks, and it happens. It's just a coincidence that no it's doubt. the same time as one of the biggest beer festivals in Europe called Beer Kirchfei. What a shame, and you don't drink beer. Well, what are you, what are you going to do while the festival's going on? Uh, I, I found a w- ways to amuse myself, and I, I have actually been going as an anthropologist, oh, okay. not to drink, okay. of course, but to observe the habits of the natives in their their typical habitat. In a more serious vein, but not much more serious, what is the nature of a beer festival there? What does that mean exactly? Well, in this case, uh, there are six breweries, tellers, that have uh, stored beer up inside the berg, the mountain, which is why it's Bergkirch via the opening of the mountain church. <laughs> what they seem to mean by mountain church is the beer cellars. Yeah. So uh, it, it, it's spring, it's warm enough, and all of the beer that has been chilling is now ready to be served. And a lot of days there's 100,000 people here. They're wow. sitting in big outdoor uh, pavilions and tables and singing really cheesy American songs. Uh-huh. Well, that sounds fun. It's very fun. And how is the? I'm sure you've sampled, even though you don't really like beer. Have you sampled any of it? <laughs> I've done extensive, very extensive uh, field work, yes. And, and uh, what's I your verdict? Say, um, more research is needed, and I think government funding. <laughs> uh, did they ship the good beer out, or is there but some pretty good beer left behind? There's there's pretty fine beer left behind. Yeah. It is nice to have it that's that's locally brewed, and in some cases, you know, old in the United States is 50 years. There's Some of these kellers have been operating continuously since the 14th century. Wow. Uh, has anybody um, accosted you about your recent star turn in the Keynes Hayek rap video, Fight of the Century? I have been getting some love about that. And Are you pretty fact, anonymous but, still? Can, can no, you move about freely? That's what I really want to know. On the, on, on the street, I have not had any difficult moving about freely, yes. Oh, I'm glad to hear that. Uh, our topic for today is the nature of exchange and some of our feelings about it and some of the work that you've been doing, thinking it in, in some depth uh, relative to what economists usually do in this area. What issues have you been interested in? I have to say this kind of draws together about four or five different econ talks. So the the basis for this is thinking that you and I have tried to do on several different shows where we ask questions. A lot of times the answers seem pretty easy, but then when you think about it, you think, well, why is that true? So as you may remember, uh, several econ talks ago, we talked about price gouging. Uh, about the ice in Raleigh that was sold at a price that was higher than was allowed. And so the police came and took the ice, and people actually clapped because Here's they the were crowd. glad that that high price wasn't going to be charged. Even though they weren't going to get any ice. <laughs> yes, it was, it was, that, was, that was bad, but not as it was important that, well, it, it's hard to say just what it was they were thinking. And uh, ticket scalping. Why is it that we have laws against reselling? And the common theme, again, in all of this that, that I've been interested in is there are some transactions. Um, I can't have nuclear weapons. I can't have nuclear material. It's really dangerous. I can't have a machine gun. There's all sorts of things that I can't own. I can't own heroin. But there are other transactions where it's fine for me to have it. In fact, it's fine for me to exchange it. I just can't exchange it for what it's worth. The only reason we have that law is to make sure that we cannot exchange it for what it's worth. I can give ice away. That wouldn't have been a problem. The problem was they were charging its market price. And what did these different examples have in common, these perhaps, these examples that... I have a thesis. Okay. I, 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 have, I have a claim 
and that is economy. And you, this has happened to you. I know it's happened to me, and it's happened to anyone who's thought a lot about economics. You end up saying, "Well, if exchange is voluntary, what's the problem?" And the person you're talking to, maybe someone from a different field who hasn't studied economics, says, "Well, it's not really voluntary." There's, there's a, in their mind, there's a difference between voluntary and really voluntary, and that's what my research lately has been on. And I came up with a new word. If you Google it, you'll actually find me and only <laughs> me. <laughs> well, let's hope it's the start of a trend. And that word is? You voluntary, E-U and then voluntary. One and word. And it's pronounced you voluntary. It looks like your spell check is going to try to change it to evolutionary. And why did you choose that coinage? Well, voluntary is the one that we're arguing about, and the Greek prefix eu, E-U, means well or truly. So there are some insects that are, that are social, that kind of gather together and do things together, but there's a whole other class of insects that are truly social. And eusocial in de- insects are like ants or bees, and it's actually not even clear whether you really can say that they're separate organisms or if a hive or ant hill is a superorganism. Yeah. So so I wanted something that's super voluntary, that's really, really voluntary. And the reason is, here's here's my thesis. I don't don't know if it's revolutionary, but I want to try it. The thesis is, you voluntary exchange is always just. No one can ever object, and the state would never have an excuse to regulate you voluntary exchange. So it must be that all the regulations that we have, and in fact, all the moral intuition we have about exchange is that, well, that's not really voluntary. So, two things that come to mind. Uh, first is Voltaire in, um, Voltaire, excuse me, in, in Candide, where Candide talks about the best of all possible worlds, and he's he's usually invoking and making fun of economists, actually. Yes. Uh, voluntary exchange. So, you're given a choice. I can't. I read the book a long time ago. But you're given a choice between, uh, you know, uh, running a gauntlet, a uh, running a gauntlet uh, where people are going to slap you with swords and unpleasant truncheons and other things, or having your head lopped off. And you choose running the gauntlet. And uh, isn't that glorious? Because you were free to choose, and you chose the uh, gauntlet, and that was, um, so you're you're better off, which yep. of course you are in some dimension. But economists just. To go back to what you said before, we're really into what we call mutually beneficial exchange. And usually that means if it's voluntary, it must be mutually beneficial, right? If you chose to enter into that transaction, it must make the, each party better off who's party to the transaction. And that's all you need to know. We have a subjective sense of what's right and wrong. And so the very fact that you did it voluntarily means that it must have been beneficial. So what's wrong with that? Give me some examples that jar... Uh, non-economist sensibilities, and let's let's talk about them. We already gave one that I think it's important, but we'll make it a little bit simpler. Suppose I have a wallet and you have a gun. Now you have a wallet and a gun because I voluntarily gave you my wallet. I decided, you know, it's better to give him the wallet than to get shot. Now, in many senses, that's voluntary. Now, Absolutely. it takes, it assumes that there's a distribution of uh power or uh, income, let's say, that is not protected by property rights. It's only protected by force. But I, I, could, I might make voluntary choices in a regime without enforceable property rights. So economists, first of all, start by, by they, there's some underlying things they're going to assume uh, happen are sort of a context that provide uh, background for exchange. And one of those is property rights. You can't just take something from me by threatening force. So whenever we say something's voluntary, we're ruling out all of the Voltaire example. We're ruling ruling out the, the, the guy with the gun and the guy with the wallet. But even then, there's a lot of things that we think are not voluntary. The biggest example, probably the one that almost everybody agrees about, is blackmail or organ sales. Well, let's start with blackmail. So blackmail is um, – I know that um, that you've been drinking in Germany. <laughs> and, and, and my wife must not find this right. out. Right, and so I tell – I call – after the, we finish this podcast, I say, Mike, you know, if, uh, if you don't send me $10 uh, a week uh, for the next uh, two years, I'm going to – 
I'm going to send your wife a copy of this call via. Yeah. And um, most people would say that's repulsive and horrible. You know, it's not unrelated to various um, views we have on privacy, obviously, which uh, some people argue, well, you know, if the only reason that people want privacy is to hide inappropriate things. And if you do something inappropriate, it should be public. Uh-huh. So, so if, if Mike, if you knew I could blackmail you in advance of, uh, of, of your trip to Germany and you – first, you wouldn't tell me. And maybe you wouldn't even go drinking because someone else might see you there, take a picture, uh, and you'd be in trouble with your wife. And so the blackmail is actually a good thing would be some argument. Well, Stupid the, argument in my opinion. But the, it's a, it's a, that's a possibility that, that blackmail might in, actually enhance. But notice the, the interesting thing about the transaction. Suppose you didn't say anything about the $10. All you did was call my wife. I, I think Mike has a drinking problem. He's been drinking in Germany. No one would complain. There's nothing wrong with the transaction. The problem is charging for it. And why is that? <laughs> you have information that you're allowed to exchange. You can do that. And in fact, people might say that it was admirable and you were honest. Yeah, I'm, I'm not so sure about that in this particular case. I, well, I, but it, uh, it, it, in many s- cases, it might be repulsive. We might think of it as a violation of privacy. It clearly does not violate the law that's, unless you charge for no, it. That's correct. So, so your point is that is that um, – it's an interesting thing that my incentive to profit is not allowed to legally take place. Yeah. Well, but suppose at the last moment before you called my wife, you said, you know, I sort of feel bad about this. If I were to get $10, it would make me feel better. And goodness sakes, Mike would much rather pay the $10 <laughs> Be a than to confront his angry wife. Bargain at twice the price. Off. Yeah. Right. So compared to what you're about to do, yeah. that's better yeah, I'm for doing both you, of us. I'm doing you a favor yes. by charging you. And right? you're charging less than, in fact, I would pay. Correct. Yeah, a bargain. Um, so why don't we allow that legally? Because, because it's not you voluntary. It, it's voluntary in a sense, but it's not you voluntary. And in, in a minute, I'll give the, the definition it isn't very complicated, but it has a part that most of the time economists leave out. And I think that's – I'm trying to build a bridge between economists and philosophers. It's a nice idea. It's a very well, narrow the, bridge, I'm sure. If we, <laughs> it's, a, it's a long it's bridge. I don't, I, don't know, I don't know how long. And there's no railings. People keep falling off. It's one of those bridges on, with vines and slats, and sometimes the slats pl- – you plunge through the slats. <laughs> uh, what's below that bridge? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I've, I, I would get in trouble even for answering that yeah. question. So I, there, I'm not going to pick some other discipline. There be monsters. Um, <laughs> so one way to think about it, let me give you my first thought, which is, well, it's not much of a choice when there's only one alternative and it stinks. Yep. Right? That would be one way to frame. That's, that's basically the entire intuition. I, it's more complicated than that, but that's basically the entire intuition, right? Um, on the other hand, uh, if you have a choice, uh, I don't know. I, I think we could probably find some transactions like that, which we think are pretty great. I, I'd have to think about that. But well, but what about what about organ sales? Okay. That was the other example that I mentioned. And the, the, what I like about this theory of you voluntary exchange is it unites all of these different kinds of transactions that appear to be illegal for different reasons. And I think they're all illegal for the same reason. So why do we? Why do we? Um... I'm a uh, I'm a struggling uh, person trying to support my family, and I want to sell my kidney, and I can't legally. I cannot legally sell my kidney in the United States. Yep. Why um, not? So you, you read an ad, and it says we need a kidney for a particular blood type, and that matches a particular DNA profile. You go and you get tested, and it turns out that that's you. That's your blood type. That's your DNA profile. You are free to donate your kidney. There's no problem with the transaction. You just can't get paid for it. And then you think about it. You think, well, you know, I'm giving up my kidney. So there's a person who maybe they have insurance. Maybe they have quite a bit of money. Uh, they'd be willing to. I, I know I'd pay a lot of money for a kidney for my son if he, if he was dying of, kid, of renal failure. Yeah, sure. I'd, I'd pay a million dollars. I'd find a way. So... That person, if I were to offer them a million dollars, would say, well, yeah, yeah, I'll do it. 
But since it has to be free, the law says it has to be free, well, maybe he doesn't do it. My son doesn't get a kidney and he dies. This guy doesn't get a way out of his financial problems. But the transaction's fine. There's no problem for him giving the kidney. So how is that analogous? I'm, I'm not sure that's true, by the way, in, in America. It, can, I'm not sure you can earmark a kidney now. But it's certainly of a different nature of a problem than the selling of a well, kidney. Well, they, they the, the, I chose my example kind of carefully. They're asking for – I said we were asking for a particular uh, blood type for, a, for one person who was about to die. And that but let's suppose we could agree. Okay. So, so and in fact, there, there was an example. The reason I chose it, and I started my talk here in Germany with this example. Um, you may have seen this, and we'll put a link to it on the website. A uh, young man in China decided that he wanted a new iPad. Didn't have much money, and so he went down to the hospital and sold his kidney. He got $3,000. Came home with a new iPad and a laptop computer. His mother asked him where he got the money. He was kind of sleepy. Uh she wasn't happy. Right. So why is that like blackmail? <clears throat> I have information. Uh, it's mine in the blackmail case. There's no problem with you giving it to my wife. She wants it. But there's a transaction that makes both of us better off instead of that bad thing. And that transaction is outlawed. But there's no problem with you giving the underlying commodity. You just can't charge for it. And it's exactly the same with a kidney. So I can give the kidney, but I can't charge for it. And the fact that I can't charge for it makes something worse happen because the exchange is not consummated. Everyone's worse off. So there's, there'd be two ways of thinking about why these are, are outlawed. One would be uh, some sort of efficiency slash... Uh, meta efficiency, something simple like we think this is bad and we don't want there to be very much of it. And we know that if we allow these market transactions, there'll be more of it than there otherwise would be. OK, <clears throat> so we think it's bad for blackmail. But of course, we don't think it's bad that we sell that people have organ transplants. So it doesn't really work so, so well there. So the second argument would be and I'm going to these are my I think these are the casual intuitions. I want you to try to give me the uni you can give me the definition and try to unify them. The second definition argument would be uh, there's something morally repulsive about bringing money into a bodily transaction, an organ transaction. This is it, it's slavery. It's undignified. It it, it it ruins human dignity. It, there's something um, they don't go together. We want to keep these outside the commercial sphere. The question is why? Of course, we sell our time. We sell our labor, which is uh, clearly something bodily. Uh, but I think most people, when they they just get a, they just go yuck. Uh, yep. Non-economists, economists go, it's great. We need more kidneys donated, yep. so let's create an incentive. Most people said, rather there be fewer kidneys, but they not be sold. There's also an idea in the back of the mind, somewhat like the blackmail example, that blackmail is bad. You shouldn't, you just shouldn't do it. Yeah. And donating kidneys is good, and you should just do it. And you the fact should that, just be done. And the fact that the monetary incentive could create more of it, I think, disturbs people. They, they uh -huh. wish the world weren't that way, and yeah. uh, they'd rather have a bar, a legal ban on it, and let's and let's cheer people on to do the right thing without the money, yeah. and we'll try harder that way. But that's not your argument. Uh, Exactly. That's, that's actually the sort of arguments that I always encountered, and I found it unsatisfying because um, the the ice example you may recall that some guys came in to sell ice in Raleigh. They were free to give it away, and most of us think you shouldn't take advantage of other people's misfortune. So they should have given the ice away. Of course, the problem was you'd need an awful lot of people to come in and give ice away to to mitigate the problem. The only possible answer is if you're allowed to sell it, a lot of people might come. But because there's an anti-gouging law, they don't. So again, you're free to donate the ice. You just can't charge for it. That means that the transaction doesn't take place, and the result is that on its face, people seem to be worse off. Well, here's what I think the problem is, and that is that we, th we have the idea that exchange that's not truly voluntary should be restricted by the state. And you really put your finger on something important. 
but I think it's a confusion that I've only just recently start, started to understand. So the, the original example about the guy who was going to sell his kidney, let's suppose his daughter needs $20,000 for some medicine or otherwise she's going to be very sick. Uh, but if he sells his kidney, he can get the $20,000 and he can get the medicine for his daughter. Well, we think that's not right. He shouldn't have to do that. But then we take another step and say, we're going to outlaw it. Well, that in no way addresses the problem. Right, at all. It actually makes him worse off. But we have this sense that that transaction is wrong. What we're really objecting to is the underlying pre-existing distribution of wealth and power. That's why you voluntary exchange is an important concept. So I want to say truly voluntary or you voluntary exchange is always just. But what if exchange is not you voluntary? It violates a moral intuition that many people have. Maybe it should be illegal, but even then, exchange that is not you voluntary often helps those who are least well off. It helps those who are least well off. Only people who are desperate are the ones who would try to engage in that kind of not you voluntary exchange. Well, I've used the word a bunch of times. I should define it. Yeah, go ahead. Um, first, I would use for, for exchange to be truly voluntary, we need the common law conditions for contract. You have to be of age. You have to be competent. There have to be, you have to be informed so there's, there's no fraud. I don't say I'm selling you a car and there's no engine. Um, we have a convention of ownership and we have a convention of transfer of ownership. So we all know what that means. We all agree about it. Second, and this is a strong condition, but th there's no later regret. You know, I can't make a mistake or I can't be a problem with time consistency. You, you, you've seen me, Russ. I'm a large man. Sometimes if I buy a donut and eat it, I think, why did I do that? If I drink too much beer, if I'm a heroin addict, if it's something that I do, but then later I think, oh, that, that I, I didn't, that, that was wrong. That's not you voluntary because there's some compulsion or mistake that I've made. Interesting. Uh, although I just, just for the record, uh, large isn't in donuts. I don't think that really captures the issue, but I just want to carry on. I, well, I, I said heroin addict. Yeah, well, okay. But the donut thing, because I drew, I, it pulled me up short there for a minute. <laughs> you're, you're, well, you're, 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 you have a large frame. Yeah, I'm, I'm big boned. Yes, exactly. I would not say you look like, say, uh, wimpy in the in the Popeye cartoons. Or, I, you know. I I appreciate that, okay. Russ. I, I've always appreciated you, and I don't say it enough. <laughs> Carry on. Third, no externalities. Um, obviously, if I do something in a transaction that affects someone else without their permission, it can't be you voluntary. So, the all of the participants and those affected have to have given their consent, or be irrelevant because they're not affected. Yeah, the, because the effect is zero. Right in there, yeah. And you know, instead of zero, it could just be negligible. I don't know. I, if I smoke a cigarette in the next county, maybe you really care about secondhand smoke, but it, it, there's a, a threshold. Okay. Fourth, no duress or force saying that you must act or pay. Okay. So I, I can't be holding a gun to your head because that's obviously not you voluntary. Here's the new condition. Because all of those are probably things we would have had before. Except for the regret, which I think is pretty interesting. And well, I, I, I added that because people add, people want to say, you know, you're, you, there's compulsions, there's advertising. And so what I, what I want to do is kind of an exercise in question begging. I want to say, let's put a wall around the things we all agree, even philosophers who hate markets, everyone would agree that it's voluntary. I, 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 I didn't mean to say philosophers, all of whom hate markets. No, Even someone who has deep questions about markets would agree that this is really voluntary. So I, I just can't help mentioning Elizabeth Taylor, <clears> who <throat> passed away recently. Th How many times was she married to Richard Burton? It was, it was more, than, more than once. They, they got together and separated a couple of times, and I think they were formally married and remarried two or three times. Which is, would you call that you voluntary? I mean, obviously, they had some regret at some point. Decided to end it, but came back anyway. But that would be sort of a compulsion, perhaps. You, you, you are interested in this regret thing, aren't you? No, yeah. it fascinates <laughs> me. I think it's a deep uh, – the, the challenge of imagining how you will feel in the future. Yeah. And I'm taking thinking that of it as a – it's a rational expectations condition. So the it's voluntary in the sense that I'm really, really informed, not just sort of common law level of informed. 
Okay, and now the new condition. The extra, now the even, new condition. Yes. I, I built it up so much. I'm sorry. I, it's not that big a deal. I wish we had some musical background, <laughs> some horns, at least a drum roll. Go ahead. Up at the up at the Bergkirchfeier, there. I think they're they're playing bad American sing along songs. We, we could have a recording of that. That's a terrible sign, by the way, of, of uh, right of, of cultural homogenization. You'd think they'd be polking and and singing German Sweet beer Caroline. songs. Ba ba ba. Red all, Sox. all night. I, I was. It was a nightmare. <laughs> Red Sox fans everywhere rejoice. Yeah, it's <laughs> it's it's become a Red Sox anthem. Um, yeah. And, and as we, uh, I you know I, I laugh. It's really fun. Okay, carry on. So let's hear it. <laughs> we'll, we'll we'll try to come back to the subject. Yeah. Batnas. Now that that sounds like the thing that Luke Skywalker cut open and crawled inside on the ice planet Hoth. I realize. What was it again? Batna. Spell it. B a t n a. Okay. And, it's an acronym. Okay. It's the best alternative to a negotiated agreement. Okay. And what does BATNA, that mean? B-A-T-N-A, the best alternative to a negotiated agreement. And uh, transaction is not you voluntary if the disparity in BATNAs is too great. Now, all a BATNA is, this is some the uh, people at the, the Harvard uh, Kennedy School of Government came up with this idea. Because you need to capture how much I need access to the transaction. And so it's my next best alternative. So if I'm walking, if I'm going to a grocery store and I have my cart and I think, oh, we need some water, I look and bottles of water are uh, on sale for $1,000 a bottle. I just laugh. I assume it's mismarked or that, that's stupid. I go, to the, and I go to another grocery store and I get them for 99 cents like always. So my best alternative to a negotiated agreement in that grocery store at this point is I get I, I spend five more minutes and I get it for ninety nine cents. That's fine. But suppose that I have in my pocket five thousand dollars, I've gotten lost, and I'm wandering in a desert and I see like a vision coming over the hill. Tony's taco truck. Tony's Taco Truck has a sign on the side, and it says, today's special, three tacos for $5, and there's a drink special. One bottle of water for $1,000, or three bottles for 2500 I say, Tony, what are you doing? I'm, I'm, I'm dying of thirst here. Well, he even, says, even, well, even better, by the way, is he, he sees you, and then he changes the sign. It, it says something before, but he's... Yeah. He's put uh, the three for twenty five hundred is his new rate. <laughs> it was two dollars. Yeah, go ahead. He, the, well, it's the he's he, he's decided somehow what to charge, and it is based on the con, on the condition. There's no question. You know, when he's in town, he charges a different price than when he's roaming the desert looking for someone who just might be running out of water. Right. So he's clearly trying to take advantage of my desperate position if he finds someone like me. So he asks, "Do you you, you have the money, right?" Yeah, I do, in fact. I, I, but I, I don't want to have to pay that. All right. He starts the car. I, wait, 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 Tony. All right. I'll have the three for 2500 please. And throw in some tacos. <laughs> uh, that's not you voluntary, because the disparity in Batna's is enormous. For me, not having access to that exchange means that I'll die of thirst. For him, yeah, it's, it's a little bit of money, but he goes back to the city. It doesn't change very much. So power in economics is an enormous disparity in badness. And it, that happens any time when you have monopoly power. But it, we, we worry about it, not so much about monopoly power. I don't care that much about the fact that I can only buy iTunes from Apple because there's some other things. If I really care about iTunes, though, I'm stuck. But... The, my BATNA, the best alternative is I'm not going to die. I'll get music somewhere else. In the case of Tony's Taco Truck, though, when I'm in the desert, the disparity in BATNAs is enormous. And I'm arguing that it's that disparity in BATNAs that makes us say those transactions should be outlawed. Let me just ask a technical question. Why isn't it... I'm a little confused about the language of the acronym. So... Best alternative to a, negoti a negotiated agreement what does that between mean? the two of us. You, you and I are trying to negotiate it. Oh, I got it. Okay, so so our our the best alternative I have to the tw three for twenty five hundred is death. Yes, in this and case. that stinks. His best alternative, of course, the economist in me, alas, says, but he's wandering the desert in a truck. He's got a lot of expenses, so you know it could be that that his margin is quite low. 
right? It could be he's barely profiting from this. But even in that situation, you're suggesting, and I think every, a lot of people would agree, especially non-economists, there's something alarming, disturbing, um, uncomfortable about I'm just the saying gap. It's, it's, it, it's not you voluntary. Cause, cause now, the, there's no way it should be illegal. But it probably would be, which means that he isn't out there roaming in the first place, and I die. So just like the ice, the fact that we make the transaction illegal means that there isn't any of it because you don't get the supply response. Yeah, in all these cases, um, whenever we talk as economists and non-economists about these sort of situations, I want to bring you, challenge you with a couple of examples in a minute uh, where I have encountered these kind of conversations. When you – Confront the person who wants these transactions to be legal with the with the fact, which they'll often accept, that you're going to make the people involved worse off. I think the usual reaction is, I don't care. Mm -hmm. Even though they care about the person, which is why they're making it illegal, they don't care because – similar to what I said before about the um, organ donation, they want to live in a world – as not a bad world to live in. It's a world I would be happy to live in, maybe even want to live in that world, where people, quote, do the right thing voluntarily without the monetary incentive. Uh, you know, you think about somebody, um, his car gets stuck in a ditch <clears throat> on a snowy night, uh, and someone comes along to push him out, and they do. And the person whose car has been pushed out of the ditch offers the helper money. Forget the. This is not a. This is really voluntary on, on in technical terms, right? Yeah. There's no. There's no hold up. There's no exploitation. Uh, the person is uh, didn't say I'll push your car out if you give me twenty bucks. The person yeah. does it voluntarily, and as he turns to leave, the the car, the driver whose car was stuck says, "Oh, here's twenty dollars for your trouble and time." Uh -huh. And a lot of times, I think the person who pushes the car out would be insulted. Re and would reject the money and, well, and, and regardless angrily. angrily and – or at least start friendly but eventually angrily and would do that regardless of their income. Yeah. Even if it were a rich person whose Lexus was stuck in the snow and a poor person in a beat-up car who pushes them out, I don't – I think there would be a lot of cases where they turn the money down. Now, one argument would be, well, does it matter how much money it is? If it were $1,000, would the person – Still say no, and I think in a lot of cases the answer would be they'd still say no. And part of it was be is because I don't know what this if, if this has anything to do with your argument. But part was simply because that's not the deal I got myself in for. Uh -huh. My deal was I'm going to do this for the because it's the right thing to do, and it's not a tip. I don't want a tip. I mean, yeah, you could say it's, I'm not paying you for your time. It's just a thank. I want to be nice. In fact, <clears throat> as we've talked, I think about this before. If I push your car out and I'm poor and disheveled, and you're rich and and uh, and comfortable, and you're you're in a tuxedo, and you're Lexus on the way to a fancy dinner, and I'm struggling to get home after a 12-hour workday, and I push you out of the ditch, and you offer me a $100 bill, I probably would refuse it. But if you offered me a, a bottle of wine or some other acknowledgement or you sent me something as a gift yep. later, I'd say thank you. Isn't yep. that – so I do think that there's something to this argument that the monetary aspect of it is is part of the story, not just... Well, I think it's, uh, that, that's what I wanted to come back to. I actually think that's the reason that we start out, at the we want to regulate things that are not you voluntary. But even if you point out, well, it might have made them better off, people will say often, yeah, I don't care. This shouldn't be about money. That's why the people clapped when the police arrested the ice sellers. They weren't confused. They knew they weren't going to get ice now. They just don't want to live in a world where people can profit from exploiting other people. When you, when you, you bring money into a situation that's an emergency where the usual sort of market incentives are not what should motivate people's actions in their opinion. I actually I want to credit that argument. I think that's a widely held opinion. I just want to say that it only happens in situations where the exchange is not you voluntary. The guy stuck in the ditch is in trouble. For me to pass him by would be bad. But for me to do it for money is even worse. Yeah, that, that's what's interesting. And I think it's um, why we as economists find that 
puzzling is probably puzzling, um, given how widespread the um, the alternative well, view the, is. It, it's a. I think we need to. The I would go so far as to say you need to think of it as a preference. Yeah, that's true. I think that's right. Uh, let me give you a couple examples um, that, that come to mind, and let's talk about them. Is that all right? Yes. What about someone who uh, works at Walmart, who is often viewed as, I think by some, not by me, but by some as exploited? Uh, do you think uh, someone who chooses to work at Walmart, is that a voluntary decision? It is not, because they're – the. Their BATNA, their best alternative to a negotiated exchange, is unemployment. Uh, and I, I would extend beyond Walmart to sweatshops in the third world, yeah. um, which is some people think of Walmart as being a U.S. sweatshop, although I, I think that's quite unfair. But uh, people in sweatshops who work in sweatshops, it's not you voluntary. And so often when economists say, but they're better off working in the sweatshop, the other person will say, I don't care. And what they mean is it's not you voluntary. That person doesn't really have choices. And so you can't say it's voluntary because it's not you voluntary. Their BATNA, the disparity in BATNA is too large. This large corporation is able to take advantage of what Marx called the reserve army of the unemployed. There's thousands and thousands of people who need some kind of little job. They don't, people don't have very good alternatives. Okay, I'm going to challenge that, and I'm going to push you to – I'm just saying that's what they believe. Well, I'm going to push you to clarify the definition there. So why is my bat? I, I'm first of all, I earn more than the minimum wage at Walmart. I might make nine, ten dollars an yes, hour. I, I switched. I, I switched to sweatshops. Yeah, we'll come back to sweatshops maybe in a minute. But I'm a, I'm a Walmart employee. I make ten bucks an hour. I can make ten bucks an hour in a lot of places. Uh, maybe nine fifty. Maybe Walmart pays a little bit more. Just like the sweatshop, actually, in the in. The multinational cop corporation in the poor country pays a lot more often than the alternatives. Um, although why they do that is, doesn't make sense, actually. It's not maybe that's not true. But why is that a BATNA situation? Why is there a disparity in BATNA? I'm my best alternative is a job similar to Walmart. What's the, why is that a, a, not a you voluntary? It, where's the disparity there? People believe that, and it's like the organ donor. People believe that the only way you would work at Walmart is if you just have no other alternatives. I, I, I think the, and then they say, we don't want you to be that restricted. So like the father who was going to sell his kidney, you think I, you, you shouldn't be in such a desperate position. So the, the claim is that's the only reason you would work at Walmart. But, but again, I could have alternatives like it. So you could, you'd have to generalize to say the only reason I work at a place like that. Uh -huh. the, pro the problem I have with that is um, I think a lot of people who work at Walmart are proud and happy and cheerful. Um, so I'm, I, I have a – And that would be dis very different than the, than the seller of the kidney, right? A lot of the people who object to Walmart have never been to Walmart and actually can't imagine <laughs> since yeah. they've been academics all their life. They can't imagine having a real job. How degrading that must yeah, be. Yeah, right. So – I have very little sympathy with the argument for Walmart. I think it does work better for – and when, and no one, I don't think, is suggesting that uh, we should outlaw jobs at Walmart. They, they like to find some uh, way to, to, to hurt them. But No, they do. They, they actually – they make it hard for Walmart to come to their area. The problem I have with that general argument is it's usually a response to uh, union pressure, which is – and propaganda, which is encouraging people to feel that way about Walmart, whether yeah. it's actually true or not. So what I'm what I'm saying is that self interested propagandists spread a hatred for Walmart. There might be a legitimate reason to hate them, but the main reason I think a lot of people accept that view that Walmart's exploitive is because they've been told that that's the case. And yeah. but they're told that by people who are actually self interested, who are profiting from the fact that Walmart isn't around. So, well, the, the other kinds of transactions for for organ sales or for to a lesser extent to working in a sweatshop where we would want to outlaw it. Um, the, the, the claim, and I'm, I'm pretty convinced of this, I think I can document it, that I have to change the language a little bit, but what people are saying is you would only do that if you don't have any alternatives, and so we should outlaw it. That's basically the same as saying it's, it's a disparity in badness. Yeah, I think, that's, I think there's something to that. Um, 
Let me tell you a story. I don't think I've told it on the program before, but it's a story I tell a lot when I speak because it was so illuminating to me. I once taught a group of uh, social work graduate students economics. This was at Washington. <laughs> let let me laugh. laugh for a yeah. second. <laughs> well, it was a very interesting experience. It was at Washington University in St. Louis, and Washington University has a very good social work school. Yeah. And a group of, of, of social work graduates, I think it's number one or number two in the country in terms of the rankings. And these students came to me and they said, you know, we are taught economics in our social work classes. We have an economics class, but we have a feeling we're getting a particular viewpoint and we'd be interested in hearing something else. And what they meant was they were getting something Marxist or close to Marxist and they would like something more market oriented. And, and so you were the man for the job. They chose me, which was flattering. And I made a deal with them, interestingly, given our conversation, I made a deal with them that um, I would not – they would not pay me and I would not give them any grades. Uh -huh. It was just a voluntary – a you voluntary, I think. Uh, well, metaphorically, their car was in the ditch. <laughs> well, that's true. <laughs> uh, it's, that's flattering. I don't know if that's true. I don't know if I, I, don't know if I pushed them out. But, but it, I thought it would be an interesting experience to teach without anything being at stake other than just the knowledge. And I said, we'll do it. We'll have three or four meetings, and if we both think it's productive and enjoyable, we'll, we'll extend it. We'll make a commitment to a certain number. And we did, and we continued, and it was a very illuminating and interesting experience for me. I hope for them as well. But one of the students in the class told me a story that I found fascinating, which relates to what we're talking about. She had been visiting in Nepal, and she had clothes that needed cleaning. And she found out that you could hire a washerwoman to – do your clothes for you. There was no washing machine. There were no laundromats, everybody where she was. So she went to hire someone and the wage of the person that she was going to hire was so appallingly low. And let's say it was 10 cents an hour, uh, the equivalent of say 10 cents an hour. She was so horrified at that, that she decided not to hire this woman. Huh. And I, I, at the she time, be exploitative. Exactly. She said, I wasn't going to exploit this woman. So I thought, you've exploited her. By not exploiting her, you've assigned her to something perhaps worse. And it, it, or maybe. She must think it's worse. The woman was taking it voluntarily, though thrilled, not you voluntarily. And was looking for work. Yeah. Maybe she had a hungry child. Who knows? Maybe she needed money for medical care, as, as we've talked about. She was desperate, desperate enough to work for 10 cents an hour. And the students refused to engage in this transaction. Uh, Allegedly because she cared about the woman. And yes. I, as an economist, this is very difficult to understand. Uh, the more I thought about it, the more I understood it. One of the aspects, of course, would be when I tell this to my students, one of their reactions is always, well, she should have paid her more yeah. if it bothered her. Of course, then you ask the question, how much more? American minimum wage, American so-called living wage. Uh, and if you did that, if you offered her, say, $10 an hour instead of – 10 cents an hour, what would her reaction be, the washerwoman? Would she be thrilled, offended? Uh, where would the line form <laughs> when the word got out that you were paying 100 times uh, – I got that right – 100 times the, uh, the, the going rate? Yeah, there would be, be a giant rent-seeking contest. Problem. How would you deal with that? And I started to think about – I put myself in my student's shoes and I tried to think about why you could come to that conclusion and feel good about it. Um, I had a... It's the disparity in Batna. Yeah, and and I had a... Uh, right, exactly. This was a woman, my student, who was going to come back to Western life, earn a, a, an extraordinarily large income uh, by third world standards and perhaps even a decent income by Western standards, but certainly compared to the standards of this woman, the gap between their well-being was so large yeah. uh, over a lifetime that, that this was just an unimaginable transaction. And so it's as if a tra that transaction is inherently exploitative, not because of the features of the transaction, but because of the disparity in badness. Because both people are clearly going to be made better off. Yep. Uh, yeah, why that, wouldn't you the joyfully point. engage in this transaction and she couldn't do it? Uh, yep. The punchline of the story is that um, – so she did her own laundry, uh, threw, out her huh. sh threw out her shoulder because it's extremely difficult, painful work. And ended, up, and ended up hiring the woman anyway, um, eventually. <laughs> the, um, the personal experience that I had like this was I was once house-sitting for uh, someone when I was in Santiago, Chile, 
uh, working at a think tank there a summer between uh, years in graduate school. And it turned out that with the house, there was a, a cook. So I came home from work the first day I was house sitting and there was a uh, I put my feet up on the on the table, the, the coffee table. I'm reading the newspaper, and a woman comes out of the kitchen, says, "Ask me in in Spanish what I'd like for dinner." <laughs> and I said, "What do you mean?" And she for me, she was the cook, and she was gonna make whatever I wanted. And I was extremely uncomfortable with this, and I yeah. said, uh, "We'll make whatever you feel like," which she was extremely right. uncomfortable with, right? <laughs> uh, so we eventually came to some. I forget how we came to some conclusion, but we came to some conclusion about what she was gonna cook, and. She's in the kitchen cooking. I'm in the living room reading, and I realize this is making me uncomfortable. Yeah. This woman's cooking for me, who actually who I'm Im- only implicitly paying. And I went into the kitchen to chat but with she, her. She's being paid. She was being paid, but in a obviously a very small amount. Yeah. Uh, I went into the kitchen to chat with her, which totally violated the social norms. She was very yeah. uncomfortable, and we proceeded to have a awkward conversation uh, in very bad Spanish, and she. I, I asked her what music she liked. She liked Frank Sinatra and Julio Iglesias. I came to like Frank Sinatra. It's never... painful just to hear this. Well, the next part was the more interesting part. I asked. I thought, well, sports is something people have in common. I asked her what her favorite uh, football team was, her soccer team. I, I bet she was a Colo Colino. She was. She rooted for Colo Colo, which is what the poor people in yeah. Santiago root I mean, for. You can, you can see that coming. That's and a of Colo course, Colo. all my friends rooted for Uni- Universidad de Chile, the University yeah. of Chile. Or, or Católica. Yeah, but it turned out University of Chile. And I have to I have to mention, I, I think I've said this before, but what I loved about soccer in Chile is that when my friends told me they rooted for the University of Chile, that was their favorite team, I said, well, uh, how is it tied to the university? There is a yeah. place called the University of Chile, University yep. of Chile. I said, what's its connection to the university? And they said, well, there isn't one. I said, well, what do you mean? Well, they just use the name of the school. And I thought, how nice, because in America we pretend – yeah. that the people with the name of that team are associated with the school. In fact, they're kind of just like employees, unpaid employees in college. But here they, um, they actually totally sever the connection, and they just, just use the name of it. Name. Right. It's just like the Duke University basketball team could be yeah. like the Celtics, uh, which they kind of are, <laughs> Mike. Just thought I'd mention that. Yeah. But anyway, I, I realized, again, the disparity in our lifetime situations – was just inherently uncomfortable. I did not like this woman cooking for me. And, and you me. felt the discomfort. You felt you were exploiting her somehow. You of all people, right? Rush. And I was trying to soften that by chatting with her as if that yeah, was like going to help. Yeah, like that was going to help. Oh, uh, good. He came in to chat with yeah. me. Is he, is he going to grab me? Well, not just that. There was no, I don't think that was the worry. I think the worry was he was going to, first, I violated the social norm that I'm trying to make conversation with her. Two, my conversation's not very good. All it does is enhance the feeling that I'm the Universidad de Chile fan and she's the Colo Colo fan. Yeah. It was, uh, a, you know, a total failure. Um, and I would much though. preferred, going back to our earlier point, I would have much preferred that she not cook for me. Yes, you didn't want her there. I didn't want her there. I didn't want her to do and that. Even if, maybe even to the extent of if they had offered... You wouldn't have fired her, but if they'd said, "Look, we'll you know we'll, we'll terminate her, her contract," or we'll give her sub- while you're there, we'll give her the month off. I would have meaning, and they wouldn't have paid her. <laughs> right, I would have said, right. "Great." <laughs> yeah, that, that's the, my question: is how much would you have paid to avoid having to deal with that, with yeah. that sense of exploitation? The answer is some, maybe even up to the point of saying, "Lay her off for a month," even though you wish her no ill. Correct. It just was – it was an uncomfortable experience. It gave me an insight into my uh, student even though it preceded that event when I thought back on it's, it. I, I think it's really no more complicated than that. Just having such a big disparity in life situation and in particular if some of my life situation is contingent on the consummation of this contract, that explains why all of these different transactions – are illegal, or all these different activities we feel bad about. Maybe they're not formally illegal, and maybe it's not really a transaction, but it, the, the sort of social relationship, that's why you felt uncomfortable. It's a great example. So what kind of reaction have you gotten to this idea? What do people think? Oh, I've, I've, Once I explain it, the problem is it's, it's one of those things that once you explain, people say, oh, well, that's simple. And it is, but I wanted to be able to give some economic intuition to it, uh, but uh, very positive. Uh, it's, it's coming out in a month. The first one is coming out in a month in a philosophy journal. 
and then I have two other papers coming out in philosophy journals about it, and philosophers at least think it's a useful concept. Now, here's the problem. I want to say that all you voluntary exchanges are just. And someone asked me, aren't you minutely analyzing the contents of an empty box? There are no you voluntary exchanges. Well, maybe that's true, but there's some things that are pretty close. And thinking about it in those terms, even as sort of an ideal type, I think is still helpful in understanding people's reactions. Yeah, I think and I think the interesting question is um how how many only semi voluntary transactions will you tolerate um when you consider all the incentives and the effects down the road. So I, I really am drawn to this idea that people have romantic, including myself, have romantic ideals about how the world should work, even if it doesn't always work that way, and are, are not so eager to put into law or practice um, some of those re- some of the realities. They'd prefer to <clears throat> imagine a world where people are motivated by non-monetary incentives to do the right thing. <laughs> And they persist. But the, the reason I wrote this paper is what you just said is exactly the, the core of it. They prefer that, and they continue to prefer it after I point out that it makes no economic sense. It used to be I thought you know I would be the great bringer of wisdom. Right. All Once you, you made you your argument, do... they'd nod and say, you know, I was wrong all my life. I had this feeling, and I got to change my view. Yep. That does not happen. Yeah. What they say instead is, I don't want to live in that kind of world. Yeah. I don't like you. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, sometimes they get uncomfortable, but not always. Sometimes they're not always very defensive. Yeah, that, well, that may be true. I don't care. Yeah, I'm going to persist in this belief because I just find it uncomfortable to have transactions like that monetized and be so important. So here, here's the um, here, here's where I think it gets a little trickier, and where I think people maybe um, maybe there's room here for some. Compromise. Uh, I think about my grandfather on my father's side who uh, dropped out of school in sixth grade. And uh, this is probably 1910. He drops out of school in sixth grade because he can't afford to go to school. His family needs the money. I, my son asked me, they said, what did he do? And I, the answer is I have no idea. He scrapped on the street, on the street somehow. Yeah. Uh, never finished anything beyond sixth grade. Uh, and became a peddler after a number of unsuccessful careers. Uh, probably somewhere along by the age of thirty or so, uh, he sold uh, he sold stuff door to door to poor people in Memphis, Tennessee, who couldn't. Probably that's that's pretty tough. Who couldn't get credit, and he gave him credit. This is before. This is in the thirties and forties, before the major department stores came around, before there was layaway. And what he and, would and do, most people think he was loaning money. He was not. He was giving credit in the sense that he would give goods and they would pay later. Correct. And then he and he, they paid a lot, right? He he had an implicitly, I'm sure, large rate of interest. Many of them didn't uh, c- complete the payments. He'd, he'd have to threaten to take the goods back, yeah. uh, which he hated, of course. And it was always a threat. It didn't do him any good. It wasn't very sellable as collateral. Uh, so that's a pretty tough life, you know. He got. I'm sure he got beat up sometimes. I'm sure there was stuff that happened to him that was really unpleasant. And certainly it was not a very easy life, but it allowed his family to to make to get a, to get by. And my father became the first person in his family, I think, to go to college and his son to go to college, and that's me. And and I have a very 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 different life than my than my grandfather. And I think my grandfather's pretty happy with that deal. Um, it, it's it's not – at the time, it wasn't fun, but it was part of a dynamic set of incentives that in a growing economy allow people and their, and their kids – I'm thinking about immigrants now who come to America. It's the, it's the immigrant story. Yeah, who come to America. And my grandfather was born in Philadelphia, but it didn't matter. Yeah. It's the same story. They come to America. They do something very unpleasant. Uh, and many, many times two or three jobs doing unpleasant stuff, often at a much lower uh, set of activities that, than their skill set. My grandfather knew uh, Shakespeare by heart. He loved poetry. He would have made an interesting college professor. Uh, instead, he was uh, not so happy. Pretty he had a pretty tough life, but he took care of his family. And his family, because he did, did that in America, it turned out 
have a different set of economic circumstances than he did. Yeah. Do we really want to make that hard for him? Do we really want to make it hard for immigrants to come to America, do menial things at very low wages that are unpleasant to make better lives for their children and grandchildren, even though the, that at the point in time when it's happening, we might be a little bit uncomfortable or very uncomfortable with it? The, the answer is it shouldn't be that hard in the first place. <clears throat> Meaning? It just shouldn't be that hard in the first place. Um, people who have this sense of what he did was not you voluntary, it, it shouldn't have been that hard in the first place. The state or someone should provide uh, an ability to make sure that education and other things are provided. He, he shouldn't have had to work so hard. I see. So he should have had – we should have helped him avoid those choices. Yeah, and the, the guy in India who has to sell his kidney to get medicine for his daughter, he shouldn't be in that position. We should make sure that he has access to medicine. It's a, so it, it's a false dichotomy to say, should we allow this person to make a choice that makes him better off or not? They want to choose C, and that is take away the, the sort of starkness of the choice in the first place. The problem is that's not actually what's being proposed. The only thing that's being asked is, is this transaction going to be allowed? Is your grandfather, maybe there was a... Mm-hmm. A, a Yiddish word for for rag picker, and that, that's not what he was. But the, so suppose someone's going to be a rag picker, which is they pick through rags and they resell it so it can yeah, be made into sure. sort of mufti clothing. Yeah. Uh, should we outlaw that profession because it's undignified? Well, that's the only question that's being put to you. Not do we restructure the entire society so that no one's in that position in the first place? But is that the difference? And by the way, the Yiddish. The Yiddish word for rag is shmata, which is a very good word. Um, the, but the shmata trade, it, it doesn't really refer to people going through rags. It, it refers to people in the clothing and textile business, which is interesting. But that's it's called you know the rag business, the shmata trade. Um, I, I really think that's the the bottom line here. Is people who it comes back to my earlier point: what kind of world do you want to live in? And and since they can imagine a kind a different of world, world where that that those choices would not be possible, they want to make the choices outlawed. It's a non sequitur. So you have mandatory education. So my grandfather in, in 1910 shouldn't have been allowed, this person would argue, to drop out of school because yeah. that's a bad thing. Uh, they should be forced to stay in school, and they're, even though their family is going to be hungrier than they otherwise would be and maybe desperately hungry. Um, and we need to create a world where that person doesn't have to work at 12 years old. Yes. Um, and I think the economist's answer is we don't know how to create that world in 1910. Nope. We didn't know how. And the economist would say, B, and you make it worse by outlawing that activity, by saying that you can't. Since you think you shouldn't have to, it's a mistake to say, then go and say, well, then you can't. Those are different things. What do you think the philosophers would say? Talk, they, do any of them talk about they, these things? Yes, and they, they agree that it is an important point, that, that that distinction is a useful one. It's a small distinction, but it's a useful one. So the, the, what I want to argue is you voluntary exchange is always just. There's relatively few you voluntary exchanges, and they're uncontroversial because no one worries about them. What about the situations where exchange is not you voluntary understanding that that's what we're worried about may help us diagnose whether those sorts of transactions actually should be allowed because in many circumstances that's the only thing that the desperate person can do to better their lot in life and maybe have a better life for their children. Yeah, it's a tough one. What about the regret issue? Should um, you know, we ban trans fats? And again, a lot of these are often some of these are so-called do-goodisms. Some of them are, as uh, as, the, as I suggest in the Walmart case, uh, it's, it's a bootlegger and Baptist argument. It's somebody pushing their own self-interest, cloaking it in in uh, in kindness. Um, should we well, ban I, Should we ban donut sales? If should you have to come when you come through the door? Uh, you should you have to get I mean, on a scale do, and and they take your height and weight? And, you can you can do what Cass Sunstein suggested. And just make it a little bit harder and try to have libertarian paternalism by the ideally you'd like to know what people actually want, but what Cass Sunstein would do is try to guess what people should want if they were as smart as Cass Sunstein, which of course is not very easy yeah well, the problem I have with that as we 
talked about when we had Ed Glazer talking about. The problem I have always is that the people who would say put the donut shops way out of town, that would be one way to do it, right? You put the, you, well, you're we, allowed we, to have a donut shop, but it, but it can't be – You're on the fifth be, floor and there's no elevator. Yeah, and it can, or it can't be too close to a population center. You have to uh-huh. drive out into the countryside. We're going to increase transactions. Exactly. Costs. Well, that's the argument usually. Um, my problem with that always is that the people who have the pa- – if you give people the power to, to nudge that way, you um, – they're not going to always respond to what's best. I don't care how smart they are. They're not going to respond to what's best for Mike Munger. They're going to respond with what's best for the person with the power, and that's not usually going to be what's best for Mike Munger. Yeah. But that the, 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 the problem with regret is you're already saying that people can't make their own choices correctly because they're consistently going to make choices that they later regret. I just wanted to – I threw that in there because – it, I want to get agreement from the philosophers that, okay, if that condition is met, then it really is true. Fair enough. It's voluntary. But I, I think that even if the regret condition is not met, generally that's not something the state should interfere with. Yeah. Um, well, we're almost out of time. Is the beer festival over? Nope. Um, it, it happens that it, uh, I'm leaving well before it's over. How do we explain that? <laughs> I have to go to a... Another conference in Utah starting on on uh, in a few days. So uh, uh, my my busy work life is is uh, is in the way. I have to go to a conference on the slopes of the Mogul uh, venue for the 2002 Olympics. So it it Russ, it's very difficult to be me. Well, I was going to say I I don't know which is more you voluntary uh, you leaving to go do that or you staying behind because you're constrained by the regret you're going to have later about all, I don't know. It's, it's complicated. <laughs> well, I wish you safe travels, Mike. Th- thanks very much. And it, it was as always a great pleasure to be on. My guest today has been Mike Munger of Duke university. And where are you right now? What university have you been at? Frederick Alexander university. Yes. Uh, thanks for being part of econ talk. Talk to you later. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.